uh, it's nice to see people back here for the uh, next uh, installment in this uh, fascinating journey through Jewish philosophy. And uh, I'll uh, get straight into it because we have a, a fair bit of material to cover today. Uh, last week, if you would recall, we were looking uh, at the incredibly important moment of uh, Jewish philosophy, which was rising to the challenge of uh, 12th and 13th century science, for want of a better term, and the dominance, dominance of the philosophy of Aristotle. Uh, so what we had was, we, had, we looked primarily at, uh, at Maimonides. We looked at Avram ibn Dawood, and uh, Maimonides is uh, no doubt the dominant figure in Jewish philosophy through all the Middle Ages, and he's trying, in great summary, he's trying to marry the uh, philosophy of Aristotle, which had become the dominant thought paradigm of the Middle Ages, to the Torah as a source of revelation. And that's all very good, and that created an entire uh, movement in Jewish thought, but it also created great concerns, <clears throat> as we uh, alluded to last week, created great concerns for people that were not accessing uh, the uh, nuances of Aristotelian philosophy. And in fact, the Rambam left us with some serious questions, such as, if the mitzvot are pathways to philosophical enlightenment, and if the whole thing is about knowledge and about enlightenment, then uh, why, at the end of the day, do I need the Torah? Why do I need the revealed word of God if I've got the philosophy of Aristotle? Is a question that a lot of people were asking uh, and was one of the uh, conflicts arising after the philosophy of the Rambam. But today, we're going to look at a very, very important moment in Jewish history that is a couple of centuries later. Uh, the rest of this series will be dealing with uh, what's happened in Jewish philosophy after the Enlightenment, but before the Enlightenment, before the 16th and 17th centuries, we have one very, very important and critical moment in Jewish philosophy that happens towards the end of the 14th and the beginning of the 15th centuries. And in order to highlight when it is I'm talking about and the importance of this particular moment, I'm going to show you a, a graphic now that is a historical timeline, but I want you to see something in this timeline. This is not a timeline you'll see every day and you won't see it everywhere, but I'm going to show it to you and it will enable you to understand something very, very profound. We're going to talk today about the philosophies of Hastai Kreskes and his student, Yosef Albo, who uh, we uh, group amongst a series of thinkers around this time that we could label roughly the anti-Aristotelians. They're going to deconstruct the Rambam's ideas and they're going to leave Jewish philosophy with a very, very, very important thought revolution and a legacy that is still with us. But what I want us to do is I want you to see where Chris Gus and Albo are living and the challenges. Every moment in Jewish philosophy responds to challenges. And have a look at this. This is something you don't often see. And what you can see immediately is that the, uh, the story of Spanish Jewry over the course of a century from the end of the 14th to the end of the 15th century is a total train wreck that happens over the course of 100 years. And Chris Gus and Albo are living right at the moments where that train wreck is taking off. Uh, but what's important to realize is that while all that is going on in Spain, while we have this horrendous decline of Spanish Jewry through the massacres, the debates of Tortosa that I'll talk about, the Spanish Inquisition, and finally the expulsion. While all that is going on elsewhere in Europe, things are changing radically in other ways. Uh, we see Gutenberg, the rise of printing, uh, the rise of the Renaissance, and that project is going on concurrently with the destruction of Spanish Jewry. And that's a very important historical time for us to understand. Prescott and Albo are living at the beginning of this, but their legacy survives it in many ways, due in no small part to what was happening elsewhere in Europe with the rise of humanism and the rise of the Renaissance. 
because Kreskas, particularly, and to an extent Albo, are amongst those early thinkers who were kicking off that project. But let's get into it. Let's have a look now at what uh, Hastai Kreskas is uh, really all about. And Hastai Kreskas is uh, not just a philosopher. He was a great rabbi, a communal leader. He was a favorite at the court of Aragon. And he was a student of the Ram, Rabbeinu Nisim of Gerondi, one of the great, great uh, halachic authorities of the Middle Ages. And Hasdai Kreskas was his student. And Kreskas was an unbelievably cultured and well-read individual. Bear in mind, when we talk about, when we talk about these Spanish rabbis of the Middle Ages, they were not simply men who had spent all their time studying the Talmud. To be a rabbinic leader in the Middle Ages meant you had to be right across the whole range of human thought, and you had to be familiar with philosophy, you had to be familiar with mathematics, with science, you had to be familiar with geography, uh, with biology, with medicine, uh, with all of the things that we would today called the uh, secular arts and sciences, were second nature to these people. Without them, they would not be respected as leaders. And so Hanste Kreskus is a great example of that, someone who comes to the fore in rabbinic leadership uh, during the 14th century. But uh, after a very distinguished career towards uh, the end of his life, he suffered some tremendous tragedies. And one of those was the fact that his son, was killed in the massacres at Barcelona that happened in 1390, 1391. If you haven't heard about those tremendous massacres in, of the Jewish communities of Spain, you should read about it. We covered them extensively in our history series on the 14th century, but it is, uh, was, a, was a huge pivotal moment and caused Crescas to think deeply about what was uh, the cause of this tremendous tragedy to Spanish Jewry. And there were many people, no one was short of speculating on why this happened, but one of the main culprits that people were pointing fingers at uh, was the philosophy of Maimonides and the philosophy of Aristotle. I'm not saying that Crescas was suggesting that, God forbid, Maimonides was responsible for the massacres in Spain at the end of the 14th century, but there was a feeling that the great challenge that had come to Jewish thought was coming from Maimonides' uh, adherence to Aristotelian thought at the yardstick of truth. Philosophy for Crescas was not an exercise that should be employed in justifying religion. He rejected the entire project of Maimonides. To take your revealed religion and to set it on a base of rationalism and scientific rationalism and it has it had emerged from Greece and then through the Middle Ages, through Islamic, through Arabic thought, and then Christian thought and Jewish thought was completely wrong. It reminds, uh, it, re it, it would remind you of someone who walks into someone's house uh, finding uh, five minutes before Shabbat and finding... Um, and finding the Gentile cleaner lighting your Shabbat candles. That's not really what's supposed to be happening, says Kreskas. Philosophy is very, very good at doing the cleaning. It can give us some very good insights into logic and rationality, but it's not what we base our understanding of the world upon. Religion is based on revelation but that does not mean it can't also be logical and it can't also be rational, but it's not built up from syllogisms and logic and your supposed speculations and observations. Now, Kreskas was so concerned about this that he wrote a very, very important book called Or Hashem, or The Light of God, as it happens. Uh, as it happens, I have here a, um, this is what, uh, it's interesting, I, I don't often uh, show this, but this is, um, th this is the title page of the first ever edition of The Light of God, 
which was uh, printed uh, first in the in in the uh, in the early 16th century, uh, and it's it's just a very very cool cover. So I, I I wanted to show you that, but I want to get to terms with what Crescas is really saying. Crescas is saying that when you indulge in the exercise of philosophy, in the exercise of using your mind to set up some kind of system by which to understand the world, and you're going to base it upon revelation, you need parameters. If you don't have parameters that are guided by revelation, uh, logically understood, but at the end of the day, guided by revelation, not guided by some guy running around in 4th century BCE, Greece, but actually using revelation as your guidepost by which to understand reality, that, that you need parameters for this. And Crescas's parameters are fascinating because they're based primarily on the rejection of the ideas promoted by Maimonides and by Levi Ben Gerson that we touched on last week. And uh, the first thing that Crescas wants to tell you, uh, he's very, very cross with uh, Gershonides. He's very cross with Levi Ben Gershon. If you recall last week, we mentioned one of the radical ideas of Levi Ben Gershon was the limitation of God's omniscience uh, in order to provide for the notion as a solution for free will. And Crescas is, the first thing Crescas is saying that, look, when it comes to God, everything that we can say about God uh, has to be by way of understanding that God foundationally is infinite. Way, 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 way beyond our understanding. What, what, what was the rum bum saying? What was Maimonides basically saying? Maimonides was basically saying that at the end of the day, the main thing that's going on is knowledge. Divine influence comes into the world through the active intellect, which in a sense creates the world as it thinks. The job of the human being, the purpose of the human being, is to grow in spiritual consciousness, is to gain knowledge of God, so much so that knowledge not only determines your level of individual providence, but it also determines even the afterlife for you. Your entire job in this world is to contemplate and is to know, is to work on your intellect, and it is to gain knowledge. Expand your spiritual consciousness and gain knowledge. And Crescas is coming along and saying, the Rambam was not correct. It's a big moment in Jewish philosophy. The Rambam is wrong. It all sounds very, very good. But knowledge, the perfection of your intellect, knowledge is not what it is about. It is not the purpose of the world and it's not the purpose of the human. What is it really all about, says Chris Gus? It's not about knowledge. It's about love. At the end of the day, this revolution that Chris Gus makes is foundationally important. It not only profoundly affects thinkers coming a bit later like Spinoza and so on, but it takes Jewish thought and puts it on a much more uh, existential and ethical framework than the Rambam's emphasis on intellectual attainment. So in order to understand that, we need parameters, that Jewish thought needs parameters by which it can be guided. The first thing is that anything with God, you can't understand God. You can't use your rational intellect to understand God. God is way, way above the ability of the human intellect to comprehend. And anything we can say about God can only be said if we talk about it in terms of the infinite. Only, and, 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 and that doesn't just apply to God's knowledge. It applies to God's power. It applies to God's providence. Let's have a look. I've, I've got this thing I want to show you. You know, um, I've been doing these very kind of uh, interesting charts. And with this particular thing about um, the light of God, 
and Cress Gus's thought. I, I did actually two diagrams. So I'm going to show you both. I couldn't discern, decide which one I like best, but uh, this is this, this this is the first one I did um, just to show you. And then, and then I looked at that and I thought, oh, you know what? Um, I don't want to put the divine in a box. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to uh, do this and we'll stick with this one. Have a look at this. Now, uh, Kreska says, look, God knows everything. So they, they, they just forget, forget Levi Ben Gershom's uh, discussion about the limitations on what God knows and what God doesn't know. God is completely infinite because of the, he's not happy with Maimonides' ne, via negativa that we discussed last week when we talked about the fact that you can only say things about God in the double negative. Forget that, says Kreskas. We can say whatever we like about God so long as when we talk about an attribute of the divine, we realize that it's infinite. God is everywhere. God is omniprovident, meaning that it is not the case, as Maimonides tells you, that your uh, that your particular individual providence is dependent upon your attainment of perfection of intellect. Uh, God's individual providence is absolutely everywhere. And of course, God is completely omnipotent. This whole question, you know, the middle, can God create a rock that he can't pick up? Any sentence that starts with the words, can God for Christians, Christus, the answer is yes. God can do anything, even things beyond your understanding. So Jewish philosophy cannot cross those boundaries in discussions of God. God is all-knowing, all-provident, and all-powerful because God is the infinite and is above the rational intellect. In the human realm, there are three fundamentally fundamental phenomena that Jewish thought can, cannot cross the boundaries of. Of course, these are not so much principles for Kreskas, but they are guidelines. So that, for example, prophecy. Now, Kreskas disagreed with the Rambam. The Rambam said that prophecy was attainment, uh, into perfection of the rational intellect, that a person could have such incredible clarity of intellect and uh, insight, rational insight that what they're perceiving is a, a revelation of truth, and that is prophecy, but it comes from the intellect. And Kreskas is going, no. Prophecy is something that is decided by the divine. If God decides you're going to be a prophet, zap. It's nothing to do with your attainment of intellect. Similarly with free will. So how does free will exist where... Uh, God is omniscient. And here Christus goes very, very anticipatory on the whole rise of the humanist thought revolution, which ultimately leads to existential answers to these questions. And Christus is saying, look, it's not, our, it's not within our intellect to be able to solve that problem. What's important is you feel free. You are free. Don't ask questions about how that works for God, because God's intellect is on an entirely different plane. And all Jewish philosophy, says Kreskas, in, uh, must discuss the concept of purpose. Purpose for the world, purpose of the Torah. And that's one thing the Rambam doesn't really give you. And he says that the purpose ultimately is love. God uh, invests in the world and souls come into the world in order to reflect the love of the divine, the divine's love for creation, the creation's love for the divine, and he sets the whole of Jewish thought on that basis. It's an incredibly important moment, and it's going to have huge influence, particularly uh, on at least one of the philosophers that we're going to look at next week. Uh, Kreskas even questions, you know, it's very interesting because Kreskas even questions whether or not it's actually a, a, a commandment, a mitzvah to believe in God. And he ends up by saying that it is not. There's no commandment to believe in God. Why is there no commandment to believe in God? The Rambam tells you there's a commandment to believe in God. Kreskas says there's no commandment to believe in God. First of all, because 
belief in God underpins the whole system. It'd be ridiculous if you didn't believe in God. But more importantly, you can only be commanded in things over which you have free choice. And the belief in God is so innate inside the Jewish soul that it is not something that is subject to free choice. Every soul in the world ultimately believes in God. And the evidence of the existence of God is so apparent everywhere that it would be impossible to command that and impossible to have any notion of free choice over it. It's an interesting facet of Kreskes' philosophy that we uh, uh, others have gone into in other ways. So I wanted to talk about Kreskes, and I wanted to uh, highlight um, just just how important that is because and what what scholars have realized and some of you hearing about Kreskas for the first time uh, may not appreciate this until you actually go into his thought is that Kreskas doesn't just liberate Jewish philosophy from Aristotle because during, in the course of Or Hashim in the course of this book Light of God he takes on Aristotle. He doesn't just take on the Rambam. He takes on Aristotle. He argues with him on the validity of some of Aristotle's logical and rational outcomes itself. And in doing so, he doesn't just liberate Jewish philosophy from dependence on Aristotle. He liberates science itself. He is one of the early thinkers of the humanist and slash Renaissance thought revolution that is actually going to liberate science and not just religion, from its dependence on Greek rationalism. This is a huge moment, because as we know, around the corner is an entirely new era of knowledge that is going to get escape philosophy from Aristotle and uh, other Greek and, uh, and other more ancient world notions of science and knowledge. So Kreskas is very, very important. Uh, now, I, uh, now, Kreskas has a student, and I'm going to uh, just uh, go back for a moment to that uh, this chart here that I had, uh, because uh, uh, Kreskas, um, Kreskas' student, Yosef Albo. Now, Albo's challenge, as you can see, Albo uh, makes his fame, he became historically well-known due to his contribution at the debates of Tortosa, just to remind people uh, because we discussed this uh, in the history course on uh, on the 14th and 15th centuries, but uh, for people that are not aware, I don't know if you heard about it, but um, there were, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, there were some very, very big disputations between Christianity and Judaism. Let me tell you that the Jews never initiated these disputations. It was never the case that Jews went to a bishop and said, oh, you know what? Let's debate next Tuesday. <laughs> Jews did not like these debates. These debates were forced on Jewish communities by the church authorities in order to uh, allow the Jews to come to an understanding uh, that they are wrong and the truth of Christianity. And there are many debates throughout the Middle Ages, and as we've discussed many times, the three most famous ones are uh, in Paris in 12. Uh, 40 and in Barcelona in 1263 with the Ramban, with Nachmanides. And the third big daddy debate was in Tortosa in Spain between around 1412 and around 1414. And this debate was devastating because every rabbi in Spain was summoned to be at the debate. Um, many, many rabbis cracked at that debate. Uh, many Jews under pressure. Remember, it was just in the wake of the tour, of the massacres throughout Spain, of Jewish communities, pogroms at the end of the 14th century. And a lot of people lost their faith. A lot of people converted to Christianity simply because it was socially and economically convenient. It was a mess. But some rabbinic figures really made their name at Tortosa. And one of the rising stars was, in fact, the student of Hastai Kreskes, Yosef Albo. And so I want to look at Albo's challenges for a minute because in order to look, understand what any Jewish philosopher is responding to, you need to look at the challenges. And whereas for Kreskes, the challenge really was coming from within Jewish philosophy itself and its adherence to Aristotle and the other trends and currents, 
of uh, intellectual paradigms of the Middle Ages, Albo's challenge was first and foremost coming from Christianity. And that had a spillover effect into a project that he realized, and as a student of Crescus, that he wanted to systematize the, uh, the theological picture of Judaism. Judaism did not have a systematic theology. And what was happening was, for Albo, uh, bishops and priests and people that he was meeting at Tortosa and people that he was arguing with would come along and they would say to him, oh, you know, they would say to, say to Jews, uh, you, you know, that the, 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 the Christian church throughout the Middle Ages was finding it very, very difficult to believe, very difficult to understand why Jews did not believe in Jesus. Uh, this was something that was completely obvious to them. Uh, and that uh, Jesus and the Messiah was the most important thing going on in the world, and they just could not get their head around the fact that the Jews could not see that. And amongst the many, many, many arguments back and forth, Albo comes to realize that, in fact, not only Christians but Jews themselves had a very, very distorted concept of the Messiah itself, and part of that was due, I mean, bearing in mind he's the, his teacher was Crescas. Part of the problem was due to the fact that Maimonides had placed the concept of the Messiah as a fundamental principle of Judaism, what we call an ikar, that is a main fundamental principle that if you don't believe in it, you are a heretic. Albo did not agree with this, neither did Crescas, neither did a great many other thinkers, even going as far back as the Talmud, did not believe, did not regard belief in the Messiah as a critical point of heresy within Jewish thought. But no one had laid out Jewish thought and what its fundamental principles were. This was all organically done until Crescas and Albo. Crescas had given us the parameters of Jewish philosophy, where it shouldn't go beyond, but no one had sat down and attempted to give a systemic, kind of rational theology. Rational, yes, not rational based on the thought of Aristotle and other philosophy, philosophic thinkers, but rational with its own internal cohesive logic based on revelation itself. Albo was very, very interested in the concept of divine law. We have three different types of law, says Albo. One is natural law, and here Albo is very interesting because he's actually kind of the first Jewish thinker to deal with the concept of natural law. I'm not going into natural law today, but it's a very interesting discussion. Natural law is going to become a very big topic over the next few hundred years. Once again, anticipated by, by, by Kreskas and Albo. The other, the other type of, another type of law is conventional law. That's the laws that states and governments make uh, by which societies function. But Albo is interested in revelation, and since he's talking about Judaism, he's interested in divine law. And there are three fundamental principles of divine law as embodied in religions. Not even Judaism itself, but religion generally. So Albo, Albo's point is to start with a very, very universal description of what revealed religion is and what you need to understand about Judaism. If you don't believe these three things in some form, then you are not on the bus. And I'll show you why Albo's going through this. He's going through this because he's trying to prove a point he's going to come to at the end. The first of these principles is the existence of God. If you don't believe in God, you're not on the bus of revealed religion. I'm sorry. Uh, what your belief entails comes down to certain details, but you've got to believe in the existence of God. The second is revelation. You, there's, you've got to believe, and in the case of Judaism, the divine origin of the Torah. That the Torah is not just another book. 
but it is divinely revealed to humanity in line with God's project of revealing to humanity. And the third fundamental principle that you need to believe in is you need to believe in the concept of reward and punishment. You need to believe that all our actions have consequences, particularly in the ethical and moral realm. That, and now it doesn't matter how you believe in that. You could believe in a full-blown heaven and hell. You could believe in a warm, fuzzy karma concept, but you must believe that actions have consequences. So these three are the foundations of Jewish thought. From those three fundamental principles emerge eight other principles, which Elbo calls Shorashim. And I'm go I've got a diagram, and let me tell you that the diagram I'm about to show you, you're not going to see anywhere else, because I have displayed Albo open like a dissected cat, and I want you to see this. This is uh, really uh, interesting, but I'm going to give you Albo in one very interesting uh, graph here. Here we have the three fundamental principles, existence of God, Torah's divine origin, and reward and punishment. Now, what Albo is arguing is, is that those three principles are common to all the great uh, Abrahamic faiths. Uh, there's still plenty of people on the bus, but what we need to do is we need to work out what are the derivative principles from that. So when we talk about the existence of God, there are four facets or shorashim or roots emergent from that principle that Alba wants us to understand. The unity of God, the incorporeality of God, that God has no body, that God is outside time, so the intemporeality, the eternality of God, and the perfection of God. All these things are critical. If you don't believe anything inside this circle about the principle of the existence of God, according to Albor, you're a heretic. You are a kofer ba'ikar, because these four belong to that principle. The principle is the existence of God, and these are its parameters. These are the shorashim that emerge from that. When we talk about the Torah's divine origin, we need to talk about the fact that God didn't just create the world and walk away. God is interested, and God's knowledge is an interested knowledge. He's, yes, God's omniscient. God knows everything, but God knows everything in a particular way, even in the lower realms, the human realms where we are. God then reveals a plan or an idea or a program for humanity through prophets. And that you need to understand that there are, is a whole line of authentic prophets, uh, which the Bible describes, and they are historically embedded authentic product, uh, prophets particular ones who have revealed uh, God's word in the world. So if you don't believe that in any of these, then you are a heretic in relation to this fundamental principle. The idea of being a heretic is important, especially when we come out of the Middle Ages and we're about to hit the Enlightenment. We're going to need to know who's a heretic and who's not. So this very, very systemic statement by Albo on the eve of the Enlightenment, you know, on the eve of the new era, is in a sense uh, important for us to understand. And the third principle, reward and punishment, you have to understand that that involves individual providence. Every individual is accountable for their own actions and the consequences uh, of their actions. And therefore, every individual undergoes either reward or punishment, on which is based, of course, the whole idea of free will, because uh, there's no point in having uh, reward and punishment if you don't have free will to choose. Uh, reward and punishment sound like very heavy terms, but what it comes down to is uh, an equilibrium in the universe, a moral equilibrium of justice where all actions have consequences. Now look carefully, because in these circles, that's where the principles are and what the shorashim or the, the roots associated with those principles is the parameters of those principles. But each of those principles also has branches. As we can see coming up, there are six branches. And here's the really important point, because Albo tells you that <laughs> these branches 
are things that you should believe in, but if you do not believe in them, you are not a heretic. These are not fundamental principles. For example, I believe in the existence of God. I think God is unity and corporeality, eternality and perfection, but I don't believe in creation ex nihilo. I believe that the world, if you said that, I believe all that, but the world has always existed coterminous. There's like some sort of kind of primordial substance, as Aristotle and other Greek thinkers argued, uh, that substance is eternal. That's not correct belief, says Albert, but it's not going to make you a heretic. On the other hand, uh, I could... Uh, what, what, what he's really trying to get to is that uh, if, if you look, for example, at the Torah's divine origin. Yep. Now, um, one, of the, one of the important branches of that is the idea that the Torah is eternal. And this is a point that Albo makes because it's a very, very important point, bearing in mind that the whole background to Albo's philosophic system about Judaism are the challenges coming uh, from, the, uh, from the Christian church. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe I haven't underlined this enough. Uh, but please, let me just put this in perspective for those of you who are in doubt. The Middle Ages, centuries, centuries long, is one constant project of harassment on behalf of the church towards the Jewish communities of Europe. We don't find this in the Islamic world. We don't find Muslims coming along going, oh, you have to believe in Muhammad. I mean, if they do say that, they say believe in Muhammad or we'll kill you. But even in most cases, they're not saying that. Muslims are not interested in having theological debates with Jews saying, can you not see the truth of Muhammad? But Christianity does. Because Christianity has got a real problem in the Middle Ages with the existence of Jews who deny their fundamental tenets. And yet Jesus himself and the whole of the Christian continuum comes from Judaism. So if the Jews are not believing it, that's a real problem. And one of the important things, one of the important arguments that emerged from Tortosa, which Albo writes in, I mean, we're not, this is not a discussion on the on the, on the tremendous complexities of, of Middle Ages disputations and the polemics, because that's a whole field in itself. But one of, the, one of the things that comes out of it is that Albo is arguing the Torah, if the Torah is going to be repealed or superseded, it can only be done in the same way that it was given. That's logical. That's rational. The Torah was given to an entire nation on Mount Sinai, several million people standing there and they received the Torah. Therefore, if it's going to be repealed, it can only be repealed under the same conditions. So if we look, for example, at this, that particular branch, and these at the bottom are branches, we see that his discussion of the Torah being eternal is really backgrounded with the interface with Christianity. The other thing Alba wants you to realize <coughs> is that, and this once again, you can see uh, the anti mamonidean sentiment in the background because the Rambam is telling you, oh, no, you've got to, you, you know, you've got to activate your intellect and you've got to perfect, you've got to sit and study and work and philosophize and rationalize and contemplate and meditate and get all your intellect perfect and Albo comes along and goes, no. You actually can attain moral perfection through the performance of a single mitzvah. One single mitzvah can enable you to achieve moral perfection. We don't know what that mitzvah is, and a person should be doing mitzvah all the time. But you can actually attain perfection that way. Perfection is gained through the performance of the commandments of Torah. And 
<laughs> that's, that's what it means to have a revealed religion that is given to you by God. But the really important points are in number three, because what Albo is trying to show his readers is that the coming of the Messiah is a branch. It is not an ikar. It is not a fundamental point that if I don't believe in it, I'm a heretic. You are allowed to believe. Well, allowed is a little strong, maybe. It is possible to believe that the Messiah is not actually coming. That opinion is even an opinion expressed in the Talmud. Albo thinks that's a wrong opinion. He thinks that you should believe that the Messiah is coming. But if you say, I don't think there's a Messiah, so long as you're believing all the Ikarim, there's a God, there's a Torah, there's reward and punishment in the world. But, you know, the Jewish people are just there to schlep through the end of history. There's no Messiah coming. You're not a heretic. For Maimonides, that would be outrageous. But for Albo and going forward, it's very important to realize, he said, because Christians are coming to me all the time going, oh, the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah. Who's the Messiah? And Albo is telling them the Messiah is not the engine of history. The Messiah is a symbol of its culminating point, but it doesn't drive history. The Messiah is just a branch, maybe a twig. It's important. It's an important branch. But it is not the engine of Jewish history. It is not an ikar of Jewish thought. Jewish thought relies on a far greater universal picture. Not that the Messiah is not a universal idea. But certainly in terms of the way it was being interpreted uh, by the Christian church in its very, very specific embodiment as an individual who comes in history and changes everything, we'd like to believe that, we'd, we want to believe that, we want to know that that's going to happen, and it's perfectly acceptable to believe that, and the, according to, even according to Albo, you should believe that, but it's not an ikar. So the reason I'm stating that is to show you how Albo's national system is reflected in the challenges that he's facing. But notwithstanding that, uh, that systematic theological restatement of Judaism, of Jewish belief, that happens on the eve of the great new era that is about to happen is going to have remarkable consequences that we're going to look at. Uh, and combined with his teachers, Kreskas, who's really the umbrella for this whole type of movement of Jewish thought away from Aristotle that happens in the, 15th, uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, now is going to set us up for the, all of the changes that are going to happen. So I'm hoping that you'll come back uh, next week because obviously I'm going to be uh, jumping headfirst into the Enlightenment and uh, we're going to be doing You Know Who, uh, who was, uh, of course, sitting up the back of the uh, Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam in the 17th century, reading, of course, Hastai uh, Kreskas, uh, and uh, becoming deeply uh, soaked and influenced by that. I, I hope that this lecture has made some kind of uh, sense. Really, Chris Gus and Albo are dealing on the one hand with a thought revolution that moves away from knowledge towards an existential dimension of love, and at the same time that Albo is creating a, a rational systemic that is peeling away the layers of, uh, of erroneous belief. Thank you all. All the very best. Have a great week. Speak soon. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon.